evening. Welcome to our Wednesday night classes here at Woodson Chapel. We are glad you're with us. Those joining us online, you're glad to have you with us tonight as well. I do have a few announcements to be made. As usual, these are emailed out as well to those of you who have an email address and you're not receiving those. Please let us know so we can get those to you as well. They're a great way to be able to check that at any time to know what's going on here at Woodson Chapel. By way of upcoming announcements, don't forget that this Saturday, at 6 p.m., we are having a movie night here at Woodson Chapel. The adults will be in the fellowship room. The children will be in the multi-purpose room. If you need more details regarding the movies being watched and their, uh, uh, what you, uh, things that might be going on with that, Mike McPherson will have those details for you. But again, it's be here Saturday at 6 p.m. for a movie night for all ages that will be taking place here at the building. The last date to donate to the Tildensee Children's Home food and uh, Food and supply drive will be this Sunday. There are printed lists throughout the building and the hallways to pick them up, as well as included in the bulletin that's mailed out. If you need any questions or information answered around that, Richard Spear, who's over here to the left, can answer those for you uh, this evening as well. Uh, there will be a Birmingham trip meeting at 4.25 p.m. on Sunday at the Fireside Room. That's 425 sharp I have here in the thing. So that's what time that meeting uh, will begin uh, Sunday. So those going to the Birmingham trip in a couple of weeks. Uh, there will be a fellowship meal for all members after the evening service on Sunday. So after Sunday evening service, there'll be a fellowship meal. Uh, there'll be some surprise recognitions made during the meal. Uh, please make plans to be there. And then coming up in two Sundays from now, there's a wedding shower. Uh, for Kaylin Garten and Brian Cruz Rivera. Uh, that's from 3.30 to 4.30 here at the building. Uh, Kaylin is the granddaughter of Patty and Harry Hunt. And so that is what we have in terms of upcoming happenings uh, in the next couple of weeks here at the building. Uh, by way of the sick list, again, I would encourage you to check the, bull or the bulletin that's emailed out because we'll not be announcing all of those this evening, but making sure you have that so you can pray for these folks throughout the week is an excellent resource there. Uh, Sheila Chapel is recovering at home after being in pneumonia uh, for bronchitis and are being in the hospital for bronchitis and pneumonia. Greg Hutcherson is in room 121 at Horizon Medical Center in Dixon, so be praying for him. Barbara Napier is now recovering at home. Uh, Joan Dixon was told by our doctors she has a form of cancer of the blood. So again, that's cancer of the blood there. We'll be praying for her and her doctors as they determine an upcoming treatment plan. So that's when we'll be making sure we have special prayers for this week. And when Dolores Tucker is in Life Care Center at Hickory Woods uh, under the care of hospice. There are others as well that we can need to continue to pray for that have been announced previously. So please take the time uh, to grab that in your upcoming prayer list through that email and take the time to pray for these various folks at Woodson Chapel as we seek to have them uh, make a full recovery uh, during this time. just a minute I'll be reading from 1st Corinthians chapter 9 verses 19 through 22 but before I do I want to mention a couple of things 
Just recently, we had a house full of puppies, actually two, house, two houses full of puppies. And a lot of people came to see the puppies. Some people came because they were going to rehome them. Several came just because puppies are cute, interesting, fun. And I'm not saying I would ever do this, but a young man wanting to meet girls, women, could take a puppy with him to the park. And I'm not saying I would ever do that, but um, puppies are like magnets for girls, right? And I know of some young men that have done that when we've had puppies before. There are things we do to win people over. You know, it's funny in parenting, you have kids and you're telling them, go take a shower, brush your teeth, things like that. Then there's an age where you no longer have to tell them that. Because girls or boys, depending on what gender your children are, have entered into the equation. So now you have to tell them to get out from in front of the mirror because they're doing their hair, their makeup, whatever else. And yes, at one time I did have hair. As a young man, my thing that I did to try and impress girls was work out with it, working out, pumping iron, you know, because I wanted to look good for girls. Not that I did, but boy, I worked at it. We do diets. We do unhealthy things even. We do, we buy cars and clothing and jewelry and on and on and on to try and make an impact on folks that we want to impact. Well, <clears throat> what's this have to do with anything? In 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 through 22, this is Paul talking. He says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being one outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. Here you have the Apostle Paul telling us what his little trick was, and that is whatever it took to reach out to those that needed the gospel, that needed salvation, that's what he did. And so, as I look back at how narcissistic I was and vain I was as a teenage boy that liked girls, all the stupid things that we do at those ages to impress folks, now we have something really worth connecting with people over. That was just trying to perhaps get a date or make a new friend or whatever. But we have something now with eternal consequences. And so let each of us just consider for a moment what little things or maybe big things are we doing to connect with folks, to reach them, to find some common ground, to to start a positive conversation with them, perhaps to share salvation with them. We can all laugh at the silly things that 
we might have done as young people trying to be impressive. We now, though, really need to look and see what it is that we're doing to impress folks. This is Christ with folks that are lost without him. And so, can you use a puppy to do that? Sure. <laughs> we can start a conversation with someone about most anything. And what we're learning and what we're going to learn and what we're going to focus on this year as a congregation is how do we get those light conversations that are friend-oriented, how do we get from that to having a conversation that could save their soul? So I would ask tonight two things. Number one, are you doing things to reach out to folks? Okay, to get them to potentially have a conversation with you, come here to meet all the wonderful folks you attend worship with. Number two, it's all going to start with you. What is your circumstance like right now with God and with Christ? That's where it all starts. That's where the conversation will start if you're going to reach out to someone. So in just a moment, Tim's going to lead us in a song. There are three or four good reasons to come forward during an invitation. One is to be baptized if you've not been baptized. Another one is to be restored if you need restoring. But this is a place you can come just to get support and prayers for whatever reason. You don't have to worry about if you come forward, uh-oh, what's Philip going forward for? Uh, what's he done? Well, with me, no telling, number one. But number two, that's not the way we should think about folks coming forward. So it's all going to start with you and it's all going to start with me and those conversations with other people. But we got to start with our heart being right with God. So if you have any needs, if you'll come as together, we stand and sing. All things are ready. Come to the feast. Come for the table. Father, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for all that you've given us. Be with Sheila Chapel, everyone on the sick list, everyone on our prayer list. Be with uh, us and every, uh, the people who uh, prepared the meal tonight. In Jesus Christ's name we do pray. Amen.
All right, good evening. Um, tonight, we are going to talk about Peter. And um, I'm going to give you some background first on Peter, but, but I think as we get into this, um, in this background section, we're going to kind of talk about a few things. I'm going to get into more detail toward the end, uh, specifically about the time that Peter denied Christ. That's what I really want to focus on, but I at least want to give this background on Peter how he came to be an apostle and, and all those kinds of things. So, um, Apostle Peter was known by four different names. Uh, Peter is one. Simeon, I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly, is another. Simon, which is the Greek equivalent of Simeon, and Cephas, which is the Aramaic form of his name. Um, the name Peter comes from the Greek word Petros, and that's a direct translation of Aramaic, uh, Cephas. According to Matthew, Jesus was the one who dubbed him Peter. Um, he was known as the son of Bar Jonah, as the son of Jonah or Bar Jonah. That's what that means. And the first mention that we ever have of Peter is found in Matthew 4, verse 18. The final mention of Peter is found in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Um, Peter's referred to about 183 times in nine books of the New Testament. That includes Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, 1 Corinthians, Galatians, 1 and 2 Peter. And Peter's name is always listed first on any list. A um, little bit about his background, we kind of know that. Peter was with his brother Andrew, and they were found as, they were fishermen, and that was when Jesus called them, and they, um, of course, followed him at that point. Peter had a home in Capernaum. We know that he was married, although we know nothing about his wife. We do know that Jesus healed his mother-in-law early in his ministry. That's found in Luke chapter 4, verses 38 and 39. Um, and Peter apparently had an accent that identified him as a Galilean. That's found in Matthew 26, verse 73. Some personality things about Peter. Uh, he's all, often referred to as the impetuous one. Um, Peter has a tendency to act out of impulse and emotion. So the first example I want to look at is in Matthew chapter 14, and it's uh, verse 28. And starting in verse 28, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked in the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. So I want to talk about that for just a second. Um, now, growing up, I, was, uh, I ran track, I played basketball. Uh, but you can really apply this to anything sports-related, I think. When I was playing basketball, and, and considering that we're having March Madness kind of right now, um, if you're getting ready to take a shot, and you turn your head away from that goal, and you let that shot go, chances are you're going to miss that shot. I look at that um, with, with Peter in this situation. Uh, same thing applies to golf. One thing I learned about playing golf is if you don't keep your head down and your eye on that ball, chances are when you swing through and you pick your head up too early, you're going to either miss the ball or hit a really, really bad shot. Um, Peter had the same problem. Peter had his eye on the prize, so to speak. He had his eye on Jesus. He was focused on Jesus. And then he became afraid because of the storm and decided that uh, he took his eye away and took his eye off the prize, so to speak, and he began to sink. So again, Peter did a lot of things impetuously. Um, another thing he did, he wanted to build a tabernacle for Jesus when he saw him transfigured. That's in Matthew 17, 4. And when Jesus was washing the disciples' feet, Peter asked to be completely washed. He didn't really understand the concept of what Jesus was trying to teach them at that point. Uh, and so he asked, he, he thought that he should be completely washed. That's in John 13 and 9. Uh, he cut off Malchus's ear when they came to arrest Jesus. That's John 18, 10. And he jumped in and swam to Jesus in John 21, 7 and 8. 
So there's other instances in the New Testament where Peter shows that impetuous side. Uh, now, that being said, he also quickly became the spokesperson, so to speak, of the group. Um, and he was also depicted along with James and John as part of Jesus' innermost circle. So what are some strengths that Peter had? First thing is Peter was a dedicated follower. Now, I'm going to say that going into what we're going to talk about later where he denies Christ. But I think it's important to know that Jesus, I'm sorry, that Peter was a dedicated follower of Jesus. Uh, he was confident, brave, and willing to die. Those are found in Matthew 26, 51 and 52, Mark 14, 47, Luke 22, 49 to 51, John 18, 10 and 11, and Acts 4, 13. Those are all examples of, of Peter being confident, brave, or, or willing to die for Jesus. Um, the, one of the most significant aspects of his, of his personality and his character and his tendency to be impulsive was when he got up and delivered the first gospel sermon in Acts 2. Um, from that day forward, he was empowered with the Holy Spirit, and he became a prominent figure with the apostles in establishing the church. And he was also the one who witnessed Christianity open up to the Gentiles in Acts 10. Uh, after Jesus rose from the grave, he addressed Peter personally as the, the discredited leader, so to speak, of the Twelve um, in John 21, and then that provided him an opportunity for repentance. And we'll get more into that here in a little bit. So, let's talk about some of Peter's weaknesses. He attempted many acts of faith, and he often failed. Uh, that's that's kind of what we're going to get into when we start talking about him denying Christ. Um, another problem he had in Galatians 2, 11 through 21, he didn't believe that they should eat with the Gentiles, and he adhered to Jewish food laws in Acts 10, 9 through 16. Uh, and then along with the other apostles, he didn't fully understand Jesus' new teachings or their implications in that teaching. Um, he was personally chastised by Jesus. I mean, we just read that a few minutes ago where, where Jesus asked him or said to him, Oh, you have little faith, why did you doubt? Uh, that wasn't the only time. Also in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter was chastised then for sleeping when he should have been praying. Um, and then, of course, his worst offense was when he repeatedly denied knowing Jesus. So let's talk a little bit more about that. And what I'm going to look at tonight to get into that is from Luke's account. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 22. And beginning in verses uh, verse 31, and they're going to jump down to 54. So, uh, we're going to read 31 through 34 first. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Now again, we just mentioned that a few minutes ago, how Peter was brave and willing to die. Here's one of those instances where... He says that to Jesus. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me three times that you know me. So let's kind of set this, this picture up here. Jesus is um, with the disciples or with the apostles. And uh, we have this situation where Peter's come up to talk to him. And Peter has said he's willing to go and, and die for him if he has to. And then Jesus tells him, that the rooster's not going to crow three times before you're going to deny me. Think about how that made Peter feel at that moment in time. Peter was so impetuous and, and so brazen, for lack of a better word, that uh, how do you think that really affected him? I, I think about that a lot, and I think about how that affected him at that moment in time. Did he, did not, did he doubt Jesus? Did he think, no, nah, there's no way I'm going to do that? Um, I just think that's an interesting way to look at that and, and kind of looking at, looking at it from Peter's perspective because of the way Peter comes across in many other verses in the Bible. So let's jump down to verse 54. Beginning in verse 54, Having arrested him, they led him and brought him to the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. Now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man was also with him. But he denied him, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And after a little while, another saw him and said, You are also are of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also is with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying. Immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord and how he said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. So I want to kind of look at that scene for just a moment. 
Peter denies Christ for the third time, the rooster crows. And, and I like Luke's account here because it says that the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Now think about how powerful that must have been at that particular moment in time after he had just told Peter that uh, in, in a few verses earlier that he was going to deny him and Peter was sure he wasn't going to do that. He was willing to die for the Lord. But here we have this instance where he does and then Jesus looks at him. And I can't imagine how that must have made Peter feel at that moment in time. I know that if it had been any of us, we probably would have felt you know, this big and realized that we had just made a really, really big mistake. So I want to talk a little bit more about that. Um, so here we've had Jesus rest in the garden. He's been taken to the home of the high priest. The, the verses tell us that Peter followed, but he followed at a distance. Uh, that's an important, important concept we're going to look at here in just a few minutes. Um, and kind of what had just happened too earlier in this was we had the disciples kind of arguing over who was the greatest among them in, in Jesus' sight. Um, and, and Jesus, of course, makes it a point to say that the one who serves is the one who's the most important. Uh, and I want to look at that from a, that standpoint, too, about, about serving and, and service. Um, I want to look at it specifically as a church. So what is the greatness of an eldership? I don't think that it's found in the decisions they make in, in a room. I think it's in their shepherding of the flock. Deacons, I think the greatest measurement that we have for them is, is in their service and ministering to others. Uh, teachers and preachers, I don't think that it's found in masterfully presented lessons. I can honestly say that I don't think that I've ever had a masterfully presented lesson, but I think it stands more so to the, the willingness to stand up and teach and to do those kinds of things. Um, those are important things, serving the church the best they can. And the people that don't partake in those kinds of things, what is their, their greatness in the church? Um, I think it's serving each other. I think that that's the key point is if, if you don't have that, that talent, we talked about that in the class I did for Mike when he was out, if you don't have the talent to stand up and, and do those kinds of things, there's other things you can do. You can serve one another and help one another, um, either in guidance or, or spiritual needs, whatever it may be. There's always something that we can do. So um, going back to verse 31, Jesus focuses attention on Peter, and he tells Peter that Satan is asked to sift him as wheat. Uh, I think about that, and he tells him that he's prayed for him, but his faith may not fail. And then what happens? Peter's faith fails. Um, I think about that a lot, and, and I think about what that means. So let's look at it from Peter's standpoint. Peter, when he was first called, he immediately followed Jesus. He had no problem doing that. He left his fishing business, and, and he went to follow Jesus. Uh, Peter had a lot of times in his life where there was some doubt and things that he did that weren't right. Um, again, being impetuous, he was very willing to step forward sometimes to his own detriment. Um, have we ever had a time where we acknowledged Jesus is our Savior? Maybe we had doubt. Maybe we did something that we shouldn't have done and, and we kind of did what Peter did and denied Christ. Um, if you think back in Matthew 16, 16, Jesus asked, you know, who do people say that I am and whom do you say that I am? And it was Peter that acknowledged him, saying that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God. So I think we're all a little bit like Peter. We all are converted, changed people, we're committed, and then what happens? We have Satan come along and sift us. And then we tend to maybe deny Christ in, in our own way. Um, the great thing about that, and we'll get to this here in a little bit, is, is we always have that chance to turn that around. I think that's an important thing to take away from this. So let's go back into what we were talking about here in the scripture. Jesus was arrested. Peter follows. He follows at a distance. Um, they get to the high priest's house. And so it gets a little cool that night. There's a fire that's built, and Peter goes and sits down and warms himself at the fire. Now, what I want to look at for just a second here is who built the fire. These were not people that were friends of Jesus. These were people that were enemies of Jesus. And Peter sits right down in their fire and, and joins them uh, to keep warm. So at this point in time, Peter gets questioned. Of course, he denies all three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Again, that's, we're going to get more into that here in just a little bit. So what I want to look at is what are some things that we can take away from Peter in ways that we may, maybe can look at our own lives and maybe not fall in the same trap that he did. So the first thing that Peter did that 
caused him some problems is he fell into political correctness uh, by practicing distant discipleship. I think that that's um, something that for us is easy to do. Uh, we want to follow Christ. We want to do as much as we can to follow Christ. But do we do it right there alongside Christ? Uh, Peter here followed a distance. Why did he follow a distance? Because he didn't want to be associated with Christ. And, and I think that there's times in our lives that we run into things like that. Um, if you've ever had an opportunity where maybe you were in a group of people at work or somewhere like that, and, and maybe people are making jokes and, and maybe it's at the Bible's expense or at religion's expense or your spirituality's expense, do we step up and say anything about that? You know, that's an opportunity where we have to, to stand up and really be a disciple in that moment that's right there with Christ, not one at a distance where we can sit back and let people make these jokes and say these things. Um, you know, Peter wanted to be with Jesus when he walked on water, like we talked about a few minutes ago. And unfortunately, he failed at that attempt. Um, he promises many times throughout the Bible to, to be committed to follow Jesus anywhere, even to, unto death. Um, I think that we've reached that point sometimes. I think we believe that we would follow Christ to that point too if we needed to, but we've never really been faced with that. Peter was faced with that where he could have been potentially killed for being an associate of Jesus, and he denied him. Um, so, second thing that we can take from Peter is... Peter was practicing middle ground discipleship. Now, what do I mean by that? So, denying Jesus is the opposite of confessing him. And Peter kind of did both of those things, right? Um, when he denied Christ, in a, essentially what he's saying there is he's against Christ. Um, I think that Jesus said that you're either with me or against me. And in this situation, Peter made his choice because he was afraid kind of distance himself from Christ. So think about this for just a second. I, I kind of equate this uh, in some ways to Peter. When Jesus was before Pilate, and we talked about this a few weeks ago when we talked about the, the two thieves on the cross, um, when Jesus was before Pilate, Pilate had a decision to make. And Pilate decided he wanted to wash his hands of this whole thing. He didn't want to make that decision to, con to condemn an innocent man. But by doing that, and by allowing what happened to happen, he still looked at someone who was responsible for Jesus' death. You can't be neutral in our Christianity. We either you gotta be with Jesus or we're not gonna be with Jesus and be against him. Um, neutrality or middle ground discipleship, it can make us an enemy of God. Jesus said that we should confess him before man and he'll confess us before his father. If we deny him before man, he'll deny us before his father. I think those are important things that we can take away from, from the story of Peter and really commit that to our lives. I think we have to. We can't be lukewarm. Um, if you think about it, Jesus condemned lukewarmness in Peter. He condemned lukewarmness in the church at Laodicea. And I think that he would condemn lukewarmness in us as well if we're trying to be neutral and trying to be middle ground disciples. Uh, third thing about Peter, he was keeping the wrong company. So when he comes in after following Jesus from a distance, he sits down with people that were considered the enemies of Jesus. And evil companionship can turn us away from God. Um, in Peter's case, he was warmed by the wrong fire. He allowed himself to be warmed by the fire of Jesus' enemies. Uh, he was spending time with the wrong people. And he's allowing the world to force him into this mold where he denied Christ. Such behavior like that opens our hearts to Satan. And, you know, if you remember back we talked about earlier, Jesus prayed that Peter would stay strong, but he did tell him that Satan had, had sifted him like wheat. So what does that mean for us? What can we take away from that? So now I'm not saying that we need to turn away from people that sin because obviously one of our jobs is to go out there and to, to teach and to preach and to save the lost. But we have to really think about the people that we associate with on a daily basis, people that are our friends. Um, if you think about keeping the wrong company, what, what it can do to us as Christians, it's easy to make an excuse and get away from worship service. Um, it's easy to say, oh, I'm gonna go and do this with these friends or something along those lines. Uh, following the wrong crowd can cause us to get involved in sinful practices. Uh, warming by the wrong fire sometimes can cause us to maybe become more materialistic. 
keeping the wrong company caused Judas to betray Jesus. Peter to deny his, his Lord. And it can do the same thing to us. If we wind up surrounding ourselves with the wrong kinds of people, it can influence us greatly. For those people that think that, because um, I've heard this conversation, especially with younger people, a lot of times young Christians, they say, well, I'm, I'm being a better influence on that person. Maybe that's what I'm doing. But what influence is that person having on a young Christian? Or maybe even an older Christian who chooses to associate with people that are maybe outside of, of a believing group. Um, I think it's very easy for us to get caught up in, in friendships that pull us away from what we're supposed to do as a Christian. Fourth thing we can take away from, from Peter is that God's providence opened the door for Peter's repentance. Peter did deny Christ three times. But what happened as soon as he was done? He went out and he wept bitterly because he was truly sorry for what he had done. Now, that being said, if you think about this, if this happens in around 50 days or so later, Peter preaches the first gospel sermon. So yeah, he did fail here and he failed big time. Um, but he was able to get restored and, and wound up really turning his life back around and getting back into the place where he was supposed to have been to preach the first gospel sermon and convert you know, so many people that day. Um, I think that's an important thing for us to, to take away from Peter's story because yes, Peter makes a lot of mistakes, especially in this last days of Jesus' life where he denies him, but he does have that opportunity to correct that just like we do. There's many times in our lives that we may make mistakes, we may do things that, that we shouldn't do and we know it's wrong, but we always have that avenue of repentance and, and forgiveness. Um, and then the fifth and final thing uh, regarding Peter, godly sorrow brings repentance. Where Peter went out and wept bitterly, he was so sorrowful that it changed his heart. And he realized at that moment in time what he had done was, was a big mistake. Um, people that, sorry, uh, so people that genuinely want to have a Jesus heart are sensitive to the look of Jesus, when Jesus looked at Peter here. If you have that Jesus heart and you want to try and live your life as closely to Jesus as you can, you're going to understand that and you're going to take that, that sorrow, you're going to repent of your sins and ask for forgiveness. Um, I think there's a lot of times in our lives that we look to rationalize our sins or maybe make an excuse for our sins as to why we do things and why we make it okay. Uh, I think that we need to focus more on what Peter did here. We need to look at the fact that if we make those mistakes, we need to be able to come forward and repent of those sins and, and ask for forgiveness. Uh, that's the great thing about, about repentance and about our ability to make mistakes. Hopefully we try to live our lives as much as we can. I mean, Peter did that. Peter lived his life as closely as he could following Christ. He made mistakes along the way, some pretty bad, but he always had that avenue of repentance and, and forgiveness. It was because he was truly penitent in his heart. I think that these lessons that we can take from Peter are, are such an important thing for us to take in our lives and to look at um, our own selves in respect to the way that Peter lived his life. I think we need to have that boldness, we need to have that impetuous nature, so to speak, that we can stand up and we can proudly confess Christ um, to others and, and teach others. That's not always an easy thing to do, but I think it's something we can take away from Peter and, and really have that boldness but at the same time that we have that boldness, we need to understand when we make mistakes, that we have the opportunity to uh, be forgiven through repentance. Um, that was everything I've got, so we're going to go a little bit early, but thank you for your, your time.